I'm Peter Brownlee and I made this film. It's about my old school, Lisnashara High School in East Belfast, which after 52 colourful years finally closed at the end of June 2008. If you've heard of Lisnashara, it's probably because George Best went there, and as we'll see, it was the best school for George. It was also the best school for me. I, like most of the pupils there, failed my 11 plus. But five years later, I left confident and with a sense of purpose. I believe there was something special about Lisnashara. That's why I've made this film. Welcome to Lisnashara High School in East Belfast. This is the Lisnashara story. I'm a child in the 60s, I come from the east side of Belfast. After many happy memories, it's always a bitter one to sing the lies. I was taught not to expect much, just a minor job and a wet and rain. And everybody said someday you'll be mine and you'll be the way the child will stand. Everybody said someday you'll be mine and you'll be the way the child will stand. My name's Brian Houston. I was here and um... I'm trying to remember. I think it was 75 to 79. I left, uh, I left before doing any GCSEs or anything like that. And I uh, was coming down here to this room here. This was uh, the music room. They were doing this thing on the piano in this room where they played the top line melody on the bottom notes and the chords they played on the top. And people, the kids had to pick out what the song was. And I could do it every time and nobody else seemed to be able to do it. And that was the first sign I ever got, and the first acknowledgement I ever got from a teacher that um, I could actually do something musical that other people couldn't do. You got to come to listen to Shara when you failed. Nowadays they don't call it failing then, they call it failing, the 11 plus. And the only thing that made me feel any better about coming here was that everybody failed. <laughs> All my friends failed. It's true, that song, you know, that we've talked about, Childish Things, I was taught not to expect much, just a uh, manual job in the wedding ring. One time, when I just started as a carpenter in the shipyard, and uh, I was down here talking to uh, Mrs. McBride, who was the RE teacher then. She got me up in front of the class because me working in the shipyard was seen to be a huge success. <laughs> <laughs> and my favourite teacher of all, actually, is now the principal here, and uh, Miss Thompson. And whenever I told her I was leaving, uh, she came to me and she said, um, you shouldn't leave. You've really got a bright future and you should stick at this. I really believe in you. And she's probably one of the first people to ever say something so positive to me. So I, I'm glad and sad that she's the principal now, you know, that this school's going under. Because um, to me, she was a very encouraging person. She was quite strict at the time. But uh, she's a very beautiful woman, and um, I looked up to her a lot. And when she said that to me, I've never had anything but respect for her, you know. It's the last week of June 2008, and then a few days, Listener Shara will close. Good morning. This is an emotional time for head teacher Lynn Thompson, who spent her whole career at the school. I came to school in 1977. Good morning, ladies. I was a very young 22-year-old girl, fresh out of college, and I distinctly remember the first day being here, walking across the playground, and I really wasn't all that much older than the pupils around me, and thinking how terribly, terribly vast it was and how was I ever going to find my way around this place, let alone uh, stamp my authority on it. Lesnashara's pupils came from a wide area of East Belfast. 
Many were from estates built in the mid-50s and early 60s to house workers in the nearby factories. I would be very aware that the schools play a very important part in the community. So because the school was closing, I felt that I needed to mark it in some way. And this is the way that we're marking it. In my view, this calendar is a piece of social history. Since the school opened, we have kept every pupil record. Therefore, we have the photographs for the vast majority of pupils from the very first pupil ever here to the children who leave now, today. This Nishara opened in 1956. The original staff are here. Uh, some of these people were here indeed when I first started. People like Mr. Baldrick. Uh, my name is David Baldrick and uh, I was an original member of staff in Listen Ashara, which opened in January uh, 1956. When I first arrived, I mean, it was just a building, bricks and mortar, which had just been completed. And I mean, this was one of the reasons I wanted to go to a new school, was an effort to build a school and establish traditions and all the things that a school need. This calendar has drawn past pupils into the school and I find that they're maybe the first people into the school, or a prefect, or indeed we have had the first head girl into the school. My name's Maureen Foreman. I came here the very day that the school opened, and uh, I left this week, 50 years ago, and it's lovely to be back. All these years I've been thinking about coming back, never been back. My dad went for Dops and Stairies, and I was brought up in the Craigie Estate. Really, really loved school here. Pupils were very friendly and would be a crack for the teachers. Mr. Baldrick was a um, very tall man and uh, he taught me maths. <laughs> when I went first, I had to teach maths and English and things like this. And I had my maths class in the music room, the bottom music room, which was a horrible room because all the mums and dads went past and <laughs> waved unto the kids, you know, when the kids waved out, I didn't mind. Some teachers went berserk. We had great fun with Mr. Baldrick, but unknown to him, a girl called Moira really fancied him, but I don't know whether he ever knew that. <laughs> but I got on all right with them, because I told them, you be straight with me and I'll be straight with you. You tell me lies and you've had it. Of course, Mr. Lemon was a lovely person. We are headed off really from the first time he came to the school. He was so pleasant, although I think he could be, you know, strict enough. I know they called me Leo the Lion because I used to roar down the corridor. <laughs> I'm Charles McGuinness. I was a teacher at Lisna from 1958 until 1986. When Lisna was built, it was still almost an experiment in a sense. Uh, people weren't quite sure. They thought that there should be provision uh, after primary school for people um, who maybe were not so academic. You had to sit an examination and you said it at 11. It was never called the, the 11 plus, but that was his nickname. And there was a quali, which is another name. You know all these names. Well, secondary intermediates in those days uh, assumed that the children who came to the school were going on to such jobs as clerks. The boys, if they had the ability, wanted to go to Mackey's or to the shipyard. And there were no qualifications getting in there. If your granda worked there, your dad worked there, your uncles worked there, and uh, they wanted you in, you were in. Girls, no matter, we had very, very good girls who all wanted to go to hairdressers because immediate money, not too well paid, but it was immediate money. I had done the 11 plus but wasn't interested in going to grammar school and that's why I ended up because I wanted to work in an office. It was a case of uh, we prepared people as best we could for the jobs in which they were going to specialise later and therefore a great emphasis was put upon woodwork and metalwork. Yeah, my name is Robin McCabe. I was at Lisney Shara between 1958 and 1961. I lived in the Craig Estate and it was a case of walking across to the school every morning from the Craig Estate across the Craig Road and through the roadways up to Stirling. My father was a riveter in the shipyard, hard working man in the shipyard. 
and uh, I was the eldest of six of a family, six children. The headmaster was a bald-headed man, something similar to myself now, and uh, his name was Mr. Barber. He was quite the leader. He was an ex-serviceman like myself and had served in the Gunners. And there uh, sprung up a camaraderie between the two of us, which served the school, I think, very well indeed. He was the headmaster. He was the headmaster. Later, the headmasters were not headmasters in that tradition. Sam Barber wouldn't have known how to be a headmaster that had boys and talking to him about playing football and, and that sort of thing. Oh no, no. And he always wore his gown. He felt that this didn't so much give him dignity as it gave the school dignity. And that's what he was after. He walked up and down the corridors looking very regal and very much the part, but he was a very nice man to work for. My name is Roy Murray. I was in Lisna Shara from 1958 until 1979. Yes, 21 years. Secondary schools were not allowed to do public examinations. And that's why people like George Best never had an examination that they could do because the ministry didn't allow it. So what did they do? What did these children aim at? Uh, to get a job as quickly as possible and get out and earn. And therefore, we introduced the College of Preceptors examination, which will give them an end in view. No running in the corridors. Everybody walked on the left in single file, and you weren't allowed to pass anybody else. Assembly was every day in those times and I can well remember you had almost a thousand pupils in that big assembly hall. We all come in through here at the end and everybody stood in single file. We all marched in and took our place. We're all in our classes in rows. I used to play the piano and they were quite an involved thing with two hymns. There was never any uh, reason why Catholic pupils should not attend state schools. I mean, the state schools were set up for everybody. But in the event, because the Catholic Church tended to provide its own schools, the number of Catholics attending any schools such as ours was very limited indeed. Everybody had to be on best behaviour, and some of the pupils would be doing the scripture reading, just very formal. And then the headmaster came in from the side, and walked up the steps, looked round, and, and silence would prevail, or else. How many children are in the school this week? This week we have 21. So it's very sad. And very strange. Very strange. We have found it very strange since our fifth form pupils left to do their exams and study leave. But now, with so few children, we're walking through empty corridors and it, it really is very, very sad. Two buses have been booked for the usual school run. But today, there is only one boy on board. Because I'm so special. The school day now starts with some healthy food in the breakfast club. Fifty years ago, the school was a very different place. Well, this case is a case that I probably brought my first days in Listen Shara. It has been in the garage for almost 50 years. I used to have to do pages and pages of shorthand. Oh, it seems a lifetime away, of course it is, it's 50 years. <laughs> We did the shorthand and typing with Mr. Skillen. Typing, shorthand, bookkeeping. I loved all those subjects. This is part of my needlework. Are you sewer now? Oh no, not a very good sewer. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's my head girl badge. I was proud to be head girl, um, but no better than anybody else, really. Just was chosen. So. 
This is the first school mm -hmm. trip. It was to, to France and Belgium. And Miss Hamilton and the, the headmaster seeing them off on their trip. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to go because our family just couldn't afford to let me go. It was only, what, uh, 10, 15 years after the war. There was still an austerity about the place. Uh, there was even rationing and continued right on into that, that time. Nobody had a phone. There was very few cars about the estate of Annie. When I started in Listener Shara, there were about three or four people in the staff had cars. The headmaster had one, and there wasn't even a car park. The cars parked outside the gate on Stirling Avenue. There are no computers, that, <laughs> that's for sure. There was nothing to keep you inside. People didn't have televisions. Attended school, out of school, and played football, played football, played football. Robin played football with a boy who was to become famous not only in Northern Ireland, but throughout the world. George Best sat here. 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 I think George Best, when he was really an exceptional player, um, there was a great deal of pride in the school and pupils would come and tell you, you know, George Best, you just live beside me, miss. It was obviously mum and dad and then there was George, he came first and then my sister Carol and then I came five years after Carol. We were just an ordinary working class family living in the Craig estate. Dad uh, worked in the shipyards for many, many years, I think about 27 years. Very little money, but we, we made, end, made ends meet and we had everything that we needed. We had all very, very happy childhood, very happy memories. At primary school, George did extremely well. His school report shows that he was in the top stream at school, uh, very well behaved. But we didn't really get much time to have a relationship with him because he was always out kicking a football or a tennis ball, as he did mostly in those days. But that's all he did. He played football morning, noon at night. He actually played soccer with me on the Craigie Boys Club team. Our matches in the juniors at that time was always on a Saturday morning. He just lived for those Saturdays. Then he passed his 11 plus, I think it was called the, the Quali in those days, we called it the qualifying exam. And he went to Grosvenor High School and in those days it actually was on the Grosvenor Road. A lot of people wouldn't realise that. Grosvenor High School at that time was off Roden Street on the Grosvenor Road not where Grosvenor High School is now, off the Castle Ray Road. So George had quite a bit to travel to get to school, to an area that was a little bit alien to him in any case, obviously being born and brought up in, in a different part of the city. And he just didn't settle at the school. He wasn't a happy boy in his first year at Grosvenor because they didn't play football, they played rugby. And then, the disaster of all disasters, he couldn't play football on a Saturday because he had to go to rugby training. So really, Grosvenor wasn't for him, and it manifested its, itself in so much that he then started to play truant at school, or mitch off, as we say. It became very apparent very quickly that he wasn't happy because from going from, from a very bright pupil in Nettlefield Primary School to having the most atrocious marks in practically every subject, I don't believe there's one subject where he actually made the class average. So typical of George, he never spoke about his problems. It's uh, something which he obviously found very difficult to do. And it was just discovered my sister Carol caught him on. He used to go off to school and leave his school bag at an aunt's house who lived just across the, the big field, as we called it, in the Craig estate, and collect it after school and go home as if everything was normal. But my sister Carol spilled the beans to mum and dad. So the decision was made to take him from the school. Watch that hand. Billy Morrison also went to school with George. Robin, how long is it? Robin. A year or two, Billy. Oh, quite a long time. Huh? Since when? I think of, I left this school in 61, I think that was the last time we met. This is the first time I've been back since the day I left. I was probably helping with your homeworks in 1961. You probably were. Yeah. Well, Billy, were you in Craigie Boys Club as well? Yes, uh, I was in Craigie Boys Club with Robin and it was a Friday night, I remember going down and played table tennis. 
and then they had the, the matches on the Saturday morning. Oh, so it was, it was actually a, a youth club sort of thing as oh, well as yes. football? Uh -huh. It was an area about this size here, up on top of the Greenaway shops. That's right, that's right. And you did, you went there on a Friday night, night and you bought a pack of crisps and a tin of coke. What's your first memory of George? Right, um, I was in an art class and the door opened and the, Mr Barber came in with this young lad. I remember seeing this young lad playing football in the green in the field at the estate. I said, That's, he's a good football, he's, we'll, bring it, we'll see if he wants to play. So whenever he came down, he was actually brought down to our table and he, he sat with us and happened to be George Best. The door opened and Sam Barber came in with this wee dark haired fella holding him by uh, up here somewhere, which you wouldn't do today. He said, you sit down there, boy, to George. And he says to me, keep an eye on him, he's a bad one. So I said, all right, have you got a pencil? No, sir. Have you got a jotter? No, sir. He was quite small in stature. Uh, he was dark haired, uh, dark features, you know, thin, very nippy. I said to him, whatever you, has happened to you in the past, it's all over. Finished and done with. So I took him up and I gave him pencils and papers and all like this. And really, that's the last time I ever had any trouble with him. And from that day, we became great friends, mm -hmm. the three of us. And as I say, in school, we all became prefects together. That's right. And, uh, we in fact, there's a, there's a picture right there. Okay. Here's it here. Oh, is it? Oh, is it indeed? Yes, this is George here. That's George. That's you beside him. That's me beside him. And where am I? You're there, you're there. I'm at the end. 1960-61. George kicked me, I kicked him, he kicked well, George, and when we played football down in the Craig yeah. Estate, there was no goalposts. Absolutely. It was coats. Put, put coats, coats down, and you were playing against the two coats. So then when he came here, it was a case of him playing for the team here. Now, we didn't have a good team, but with Jordy on our team, we always had a chance. He went to Listen Shara, his old personality changed, he could play football again, and from speaking to the teachers, they all had very, very fond memories of George. He wasn't a troublesome pupil. He seemed to get on very well in all subjects. Oh yes, bright and articulate. Yes, he was. Very bright. Always neat, well turned out, a wee shy smile. And, uh, you know, there was nothing nasty about George Best. He was one of, the, one, of the, one of the best, really. I found a letter here, and it's a letter that my mother is alleged to have addressed, dear sir, Please excuse Robin from doing PT as he has not really recovered from his recent illness. Hoping you will understand. Yours faithfully, and it's signed Mrs. E. McCabe. Now that's a forgery. Right? That's actually in George Best's handwriting. George was uh, writing a wee letter for me to try and get me to perhaps cross country running, which I hated. I can remember him because he enjoyed art and you could always depend on George to sit there and draw away and uh, quite often I put his work up on the notice boards and you know in those days the boys wore short trousers, they wore short trousers and, and socks and so on and I'm nearly sure that I can remember George down in the corridors in, in short trousers. Very often I would stand at the uh, window in the main one of the main corridors, and watch him and many others playing football in the quadrangle. And it was a pleasure and a joy to watch him. It turned out that Listener Shara was the best school for George. The boys enjoy a last kickabout with their teacher. Fifty years ago, the atmosphere would not have been so relaxed. Spoil the game, spoil the child. Corporate punishment was still, still the norm whenever I came to listen to Shara. You didn't mess about in Davy Ballrick's class because you may very well have been hit with the duster because he had a good aim That's and correct. he was also excellent at the caning. Do you remember being caned? I by him. Do you? Oh, I do, I. Yeah. Right. I do, yes. Just looking up the sands here. This is the sands, yep, indeed, indeed. There's this tape yeah. here, only I see it's wooden. plastic yeah, now, but it was wooden, wooden in them days. Wooden. And, uh, That's right. 
they were fired and the next thing you were hitting the back of the head. The tougher you were, the more you were respected and uh, uh, as long as you were fair. And in fact, um, it was expected and if you didn't do it, um, you might have problems within the classroom and I used to have lots of problems because I didn't like it. Well, you expected it, you see, and I felt that children didn't have any trouble with if you said to them, do you know why you're getting this? You're going to be caned once or twice, whatever it is. They would say, no, I don't know. Well, then I would have to explain to them why they were getting it, and they would get their punishment nevertheless. There was no complaints against teachers in those days. It was... Um... If, if you had a one home and said, I was caned in class, you had maybe been caned in the house too for bringing the good name down, isn't that right? Yeah, absolutely. It was how we were, we were actually brought up at home. This is the school's last science lesson. In science, pupils were taught how to wire a plug and mend the fuse. Small lessons that prepared you for life. And Mr Baldrick might have been up in one of those rooms too, but Mr Rourke certainly was upstairs. And he was quite strict, um, wouldn't have joked too much. It wasn't generally known in the school, but Mr Rourke was very much an amateur radio ham. And he kept that quite quiet actually, but he really was one of the top radio hams in the world. Before the internet, people kept in touch across the globe using shortwave radio. And in fact, whenever he eventually left, he went uh, to Madeira simply because uh, it was a good place to um, be a radio ham. I had met past pupils and they said, oh, did you ever hear of Mr. Rourke? I said, oh, he's living off Madeira and he got married. What, they got married? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That was real. A real sensation, that. My name is Ewan Cameron, science teacher at Lisna Shara. I was there from 1964 until 95. When I went there, there was a line across the playground from the clock at the end of the boys' gym as it was then. And the girls on the lower half of the playground, the boys in the upper half. When the bell went, they all lined up and were marched into class. Trying to catch the smokers, that was the great one. I remember one day there, and I was over and... I was pretty sure he still had a cigarette, but his hands were in his pocket, and uh, suddenly there was a howl <laughs> when the cigarette burnt through. <laughs> uh, my name is Brian Todd. I came to Lisnashara, I think it was just before Christmas in 1965. Beverly and I were brought up in the Republic of Ireland. Our parents were originally from Northern Ireland. Uh, my father bought a house in Stirling Avenue. This was the local school. My memories of this school are of a very, very busy, purposeful environment. I certainly remember buses queued up in Stirling Avenue to take the children home. Uh, we had left a very country school, so we felt incredibly privileged when we arrived in Belfast at this wonderful building, so modern. That was Mr Manili's room. And he was my form teacher in second form in 2A. I have to say, though, he had a bit of a challenge uh, when it came to my mathematical acumen. Can I ask what job you ended up doing? Well, I went into banking. And I have to reassure the banking fraternity and all of my customers that I did attend over the years that what Mr Benili did part with me did hold me in good stead. It seems to uh, have that very familiar smell. Yes. That's something that strikes me. Not a bad smell, you know, in fact, uh, just a familiar smell, very distinctly. Just looked up at the wall here and all of those mathematical references, the isosceles triangle, never did get to grips with that. And it's funny, I was just saying to my brother on the way over here today that while I mentioned earlier Mr. Manili had a bit of a challenge with me, he did introduce me to ratios. But look at that. Didn't know any of it. <laughs> Brian, you actually have a career in education. Can you tell Indeed. me what you're doing now? Um, I, I am currently uh, one of two vice principals at Royal Belfast Academical Institution, better known as Belfast Inst. Now, do you remember Mr Young, the history teacher? Yes, kid me right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I eventually did a degree at Queen's in modern history. 
and uh, I think it all started down there. Mm -hmm. That's still there, I remember that. It's Isn't that amazing? Long, long time. Good Lord. Yeah. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Gosh, it's all coming back to me, the Boer Wars. And the floor, the floor. Parker floor, yeah, yes. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. And Disraeli's foreign policy. <laughs> and I remember the Balkan Wars. The Balkan Wars, yes. Big Apes, Chitofi, Bulgaria, Armenia, mm. Turkey and Crete. I remember certainly uh, the caning experience in this room, uh, Mr Young's caning experience was quite unusual. Uh, we were, if I can remember correctly, we, we were lined up on this side of the door and the hand had to extend beyond the edge of the door. <laughs> he would be in here with the cane and then he wasn't, very, he wasn't a very good shot with the cane. So to ensure maximum strike, uh, our hands were there and the cane come down that way and he rarely missed and it was bloody painful. Uh, I remember Mr Young very, very well. I believe he's now departed this life and that saddens me. He certainly had a great impact on my life. My name is Michael Copeland. I was a pupil at this school from the mid-1960s until the uh, very, very early 1970s. We weren't aware when we were here that we uh, could have been considered or counted in any way disadvantaged. This was almost an example of uh, social engineering that worked. And because the area of houses around here, the, these houses were not occupied by lawyers or doctors, they were occupied by people who were engineers and who made things in shorts and Harlem and Wolf and Mackies. And uh, we knew that we were being trained or prepared to work in factories as opposed to the professions. By whatever means, I'm not sure. Uh, I and I suspect Beverly as well, we, we did tend to be streamed into, I suppose what you could call a, a grammar school stream. We did a thing called junior certificate and uh, depending on your marks in junior certificate you could then go to a grammar school and at that stage if I remember correctly I could have gone, I think it was Annadale. I was quite content here. I, I honestly cannot say that I ever felt in any way disadvantaged nor do I feel that this school failed to equip me for, for life after school. Do you know we had an entire domestic science double period on how to butter toast? But you buttered it into the corners. You say, no, nobody knows how to butter toast. Or at least, if they didn't go to this class, you don't know how to butter toast. Wow. And I can remember at the beginning of term, all the girls were, were called together, and Miss Beatty and Miss Hare was, uh, was residing over the entire female population. And they didn't really beat about the bush in those days, and I don't know whether we were a motley crew or not, but I can remember Miss Hare asking all the girls with B.O. to put their hands up. You know, and people did. And uh, after they had been, you know, suitably humiliated, we were all asked, all those girls with spots put their hands up? And as I say, we were so demoralised at the point because, you know, there were people with both hands up. And we were told to go home and wash. I think that's what it was. It would have got rid of the B.O. and the spots. And we, you know, but uh, we could have crawled below a snail with a top hat on at the end of that class. My name, Ivan Ruddock, and I joined Listen to Charlotte teaching staff in the year 1964-65. Well, the idea was to try and suit the pupil who perhaps hadn't made it through qualifying. And I can remember clearly a lot of the kids had talents. We would be working away at our woodwork or metalwork and uh, he would suddenly come out with this expression, down tools and form a hollow square. Come up and form a hollow square and there they were in new shape. At which point we crowded around to hear <laughs> the next uh, words of instruction. And now it's time for lunch. Most of the pupils came to the canteen for their meat, two veg and sticky pudding. There were various duties that you had to do and one of them was canteen. Everybody had to be settled and you had to say grace for what we're about to receive. May the Lord make us truly thankful. And the lunches were served around tables with the family system where you had the lunches brought down in containers and the seniors at the end doled out the amount to each person around the table. 
but the food was not great. I lived on a flat on my own, so it was much better than I could have cooked at home. My recollection is that the food in the dining hall was absolutely excellent. Uh, myself and two or three others, we were prefects and we had a bottle of HP sauce. Do you remember the skin on the custard? Yes, but, once you, leather, but once you got into yeah, it, yeah, fa yeah. fabulous. I didn't particularly like mince, and still don't. <laughs> they had stuff that the kids called slush. You know when they, you know when the when the snow goes. Well, what they did was they got mints and they broke it all up and they stirred it all up with a wee bit of onion and it was yucked over. You know, you hear all these stories about food being thrown round. There used to be a thing called a ying tong spoon. You remember that? No, it was a plastic spoon about that length, and they used to sort of put saliva, flick it at people. But in the dining hall, it became peas, uh, mashed potatoes, chips, and everything else. And it used to be like, it used to be like a third world war with food flying around. They were very well behaved, really. Michael has been a councillor in East Belfast for the last six years. Ice cream? You scream? We, we all scream for ice cream. cream! Yeah, oh my goodness me. Look at that. Come to Stan the Rainbow Man. And there's Stanley Foreman outside the, the railings there. The Dobby van, as we used to call it. Dobby's van used to come and park outside the, the school gate at lunchtime. Well, I, I think it wasn't long after I came here, my Uncle Stanley Dobby talked about coming to do tuck shop and um, I think he had to approach the school and he got permission and sat outside the gate. There was a, a prefect duty to go out and actually supervise the queue at that gate, so that was, that was a plum job. He had everything in that van from ice cream to teeth and powders to milk and tea and um, all sorts of things. Whenever I stopped taking the school dinners I used to go to stand the man myself and get a packet of crisps and a Mars bar, and that was my lunch. Oh, well, everything in his van rotted your teeth. You know, you had, you had no teeth when you left here, but um, that, was, that was the way these things were. But those were the days before vending machines, um, before a cash cafeteria, and uh, children just spent their money on sweeties and ice creams. My goodness me. Do you know there why it was called Dobby? Can you remember? <laughs> Do you know? I just don't remember why it because was. Because he got his ice cream from Dobson's Dairy. Dobson's Dairy. And it said Dobson's on the side of his van. Ah, oh, right. That the Dobby. Dobby. Ah, so that was the reason <laughs> why. Dobby came to Listen Shara for over 20 years. And they used to specialise in putting a spud up his exhaust pipe. And it had been a tremendous bang, followed by the remnants of a potato being ejected from the exhaust pipe. I was passing the music room and I heard a record of Kathleen Ferrier. I thought that's beautiful and I went in and it turned out Beth was singing. At that time Beth could span I think something like two and a half octaves which is quite unusual. My father used to take me to concerts and in fact we went to an organ recital one night and Charles was at it and of course I introduced my father to my teacher. When we were at school of course we didn't really communicate that much. It wasn't until I was invited to her 20th birthday party. And we were only going together for a whole year and we were, in that time, we were engaged and married within a year. And, <laughs> and married in the cathedral. And married in the cathedral, which is where I sang. And of course the whole school was at the wedding. <laughs> the place was absolutely packed. Um, in 1968, before the trouble started, you could make the front page of the Telegraph with a <laughs> wedding. <laughs> In 1968, a new headmaster arrived. Well, my name's Ernest Cave. Went to Lisnishara in 1968. When I took over, it was rigidly streamed. The best teachers had the best classes, and the rest could go to pot. The first thing I did, I said, well, that's out. He was his own man. Now, he brought a lot of ideas of how to develop a, you know, a school uh, that had its own character. Mr. Cave was years ahead of his time. He sort of made sure that the that the pupils were more central to to things. He also 
introduced examinations for the, the older groups and it got to the stage where we were doing GCEs and the first that came in, the, the AAs that came in, unbelievable. He not only promoted the um, different courses for children to suit children's needs, but also he was very keen to promote the development of the staff. It has set the scene for the whole ethos of the school since that. It is a full learning community for everyone and everyone develops and everyone is valued. I was taught from a very young age there is no such thing as I can't. You know, my dad used to say to me the only thing you can't do is live forever. So I hated people saying you can't do that because I had to deliberately go out and prove them wrong. Kim is a very feisty individual. She is the last thalidomide baby born in the United Kingdom. Kim has had to struggle against adversity and has prevailed. When I first came to this school, I was in this classroom for two solid weeks. Um, so I had all the subjects in this classroom. And by the end of the second week, I became very upset about the whole thing because you know, I wasn't able to stay with my friends. So I took a bull by the horns and went and see Mr. Cade, the headmaster. Kim, of course, didn't understand why that was. I was negotiating to get her accepted as a normal pupil in the normal school, although we didn't have the necessary uh, physical conditions to deal with it. He didn't realise how much anxiety and, and uh, heartache it had caused me. Once I overcame the uh, legal issues that I had been trying to sort out while she was in that one room, uh, she was exactly as a normal pupil. I came out of this classroom, it was a bit like a prison cell, you know. I used to be able to get up the stairs myself, but getting down them was quite a different story. So friends that tucked me under their arm and banged me down the stairs with my artificial legs on. And all you could hear would be the thump, thump, thump down the steps as they dragged her down and her feet piled on behind. But uh, they used to let me go five minutes before the bell rang which meant that all the car doors were clear, so my friends thought it was great getting out of class five minutes early. <laughs> and I remember going back after the summer holidays and not saying, Kim, you've grown. She's got new legs. <laughs> She's got new artificial legs. If there was a mechanical fault with one of my legs, you know, anything to do with the metals, sometimes Mr Roddick could have fixed it. So the next call was at my door. Mr. Ruddock, can I borrow a hammer, please? Bang, 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 bang. <laughs> she drove the pin back in again. She was very, very feisty and, and, you know, had a bit of spirit about her. It wouldn't be the first time, she, I think, I reckon she was caught in the, in the toilets, maybe having a wee drag, you know. <laughs> in latter years, uh, <laughs> when one was dabbling in cigarettes, one dabbled in the bi bicycle sheds. Mr. Kia was quite liberal and believed in uh, allowing uh, young adults, as he referred to, the uh, third, fourth and fifth years, a degree of choice, uh, which included the provision of ashtrays in uh, prefectures. And they thought if they provided us with ashtrays and a little bit of freedom and took away the whole romance that we wouldn't do it. But it kind of backfired. And I often remember coming back up with a cloud of smoke billowing out from below that door where um, a lot of silly individuals such as myself were in there smoking like chimneys. So, so therefore the ashtrays were withdrawn and you know 5L1 had to learn to behave so that was the end of that. Everything really with me is linked to the music department. Um, I have very vivid memory, memories of uh, playing an assembly, of going down to the music room, of just the whole setup in the music room. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it seems smaller. Much smaller. Mr. Moore's desk was over there. We would have had sitting on the desk a container which had the disinfectant for the recorders and you had to dip your recorders if you used the communal ones if you didn't possess one of your own. It was horrible to put them in your mouth after that. <laughs> I 
And one of Mr. Moore's favourite phrases, which occasionally I would still quote in the classroom myself, is one toot and you're out. Two toots and you're unconscious. And three toots and you're dead. <laughs> because he just didn't like anybody to play when they weren't supposed to. Mr. Moore probably saw in me someone who needed to widen and broaden my musical education and that was probably why I was given the opportunity to learn the clarinet. In the band I became much more creative which has helped me then over the years because you've got to allow your pupils to do these things and you can only do it by demonstration. Audrey now teaches music in schools throughout Northern Ireland. Can you remember any of the tunes we played in the band that you'd be happy to have a bit of a go at? We'll have to plug you in, I'm afraid. Oh, yeah, I've got them off. Yeah. I remember, oh, Jesus, I promised in particular. Um, So Ronnie, have you been playing clarinet ever since? Clarinet and saxophone. Uh -huh. uh, I play in a, an eight-piece big band. I'm out quite often. And so what are your memories of this band? The very first band was put together with Edith Brass. I remember doing the school show. Mystic in Belfast. South Pacific was another one. Just progressed from there to school music and to where I am today, which is a bit further on. <laughs> so for a number of us then, music really has played quite an important oh, role. I, we have pursued it in some form. But there was troubles ahead.